I will introduce myself first. My name is Mohammed Mercy. Um, I now do a lot of not-for-profit work through our family foundation called the Mercy Foundation. And then we also have an impact investing platform called the Inclusive Ventures Group that focuses on four or five areas. But as um, Stefan knows from our previous work, um, that what drove our investment strategy, and this may seem a little strange, is some aphorisms and some learnings that we have learned in our for-profit journey. So our education investments were really underpinned by the aphorism that it is much easier to form a child than to repair an adult. Our environmental strategy was underpinned by if you want to plant, sorry, that there is no Wi-Fi in the forest, but you have far better connectivity. Um, and also that the savage is not the one who lives in the forest, but the one who destroys it. Um, the difference between venture capital and impact investing is that time horizons are much longer. So there is a Chinese proverb that we um, focused on which says, if you want to plant for one year, you plant rice, and if you want to plant for 10 years, you plant trees. We also focus on waste management in Africa, which is quite an interesting uh, opportunity, and that was um, underpinned by the aphorism, can one man's waste be turned into another man's gold? Of course, one of the key problems about impact is measurements, and so there we always um, uh, are focused on treasuring what we are able to measure. Impact is something that requires partnership and collaboration. And so while we can't change the world through one person, we can change it for one person. Um, a wise man is somebody who builds bridges. It's a fool that builds walls. And finally, there was once a man who was so poor that all he had was money. So, um, uh, Africa is an interesting uh, continent in terms of the opportunities that it brings for um, social impact investing. And the power of reverse innovation, which is innovation where governments as well as corporates and societies have not been able to fulfill a very basic need, and that need is then filled by people who are social entrepreneurs and social innovators. It's been a hotbed for investments. If I look at two examples, again, both of them uh, originated from the side business school at Oxford. One was M-Pesa. That business model has become now a global model for uh, mobile micropayments. Likewise, M Copa is another company that was given birth at Said um, and again has become a trendsetter globally. So in Africa, it's need um, that results in the generation of some interesting uh, ideas, but the challenges remain. Are those capable of being scaled? Is it easy to raise money for them? Are exits possible, and if so, how? And you know, are these situations which um, can rely only on grant capital, or is it possible to develop a business model that is focused on the triple bottom line, where you still make money, but also you give stewardship to the environment and ensure that society is better off? And that balance is very, very hard uh, to achieve because most of the larger private equity funds, family offices, and other organizations are increasingly focused on wanting to receive market returns on a risk-adjusted basis, and this is very hard to do if you want to focus on the um, impact space. The projections indicate that by 2020, the impact space in Africa will be about 310 odd billion dollars, especially if um, Africa decides to ramp up its efforts to deliver on the um, SDGs. The African Union has its own agenda, which they call Agenda 2063, which again requires for a lot of investments to come in, a lot of partnerships between governments, foundations, especially corporates, etc. Um, so there is uh, ambition and there is hope that at least some of this will translate into um, tangible uh, and uh, sustainable business plans, but it's, it's hugely challenging. Um, 
And then, of course, there is the mismatch between people who have excess capital um, and then social enterprises that look for money. And um, it's harder to raise money for the very early rounds, but much easier once a business starts to scale. So these were just a few introductory remarks that I wanted to make. Um, I will then uh, uh, now introduce our panel here. So um, all of you, I think, have seen their bios, so I will not um, describe what they do, but they have all been hugely transformational in the work they have done. On the far right is uh, Ella, then we have Hamdia, Nicola, and uh, Vikas. Um, and for each of them, they will spend a few minutes talking about um, their own work, what is it that makes them want to get out of bed in the morning, and if there is anything that makes them not want to sleep at night, what it is. So let's start with uh, Ella first. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about something that keeps me in bed and not want to venture into the world. And that is something I've been thinking about for a while coming uh, to this event. And it's premised on what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I wear two hats. The first hat is being an economic policy advisor to governments and the private sector. The other responsibility is sitting on what is called the National Planning Commission of South Africa, which thinks about the future beyond where we are as a country and a region. And as I was thinking about the discussions that we're going to have here, I was asking myself, what is it that is going to be important to take away? And over the past day and a half, I was reminded of what is almost a tragedy. And the tragedy is the recent announcement by Germany of a Marshall Plan for Africa. I thought that was a travesty for one simple reason. When you think about the challenges that we're dealing with in this gathering, it's about undoing the imbalances of the world. And in particular, undoing the imbalances on the African continent. And this Marshall Plan should not have been announced in Europe. This Marshall Plan should have been announced in Addis Ababa by the African Union. And for me, thinking about the subject of the, of the next day or two, impact investing. Technically, that should be the Marshall Plan for Africa and the Marshall Plan for the world. The SDGs are some sort of a Marshall Plan as well for Africa, originated in Europe, sorry, in New York, predominantly driven by the North. And my view is that we need to start thinking more seriously about designing and crafting responses where, it, where the, 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 the solutions are actually required. To a large extent, a lot of these solutions are crafted in a particular environment and then adapted to the recipients, which means the solutions from day one are suboptimal. They are not designed for the real problem that is being solved for. And that is the challenge that we are faced with. And thinking about going forward beyond uh, this, this, this session, I would like to see an environment where heads of state start thinking about impact investing as the heart and the center of policy making and decisions that they make. All along, when we talk of impact investing, we're always looking at the private sector. How do they make sure that they don't think about only the commercial return, but they need to think about the economic return as well? And we actually forget that the provider of the environment for these returns to be realized are actually governments. And if they don't play the game, the likelihood is that the objectives or the plans that we're trying to put together here are going to fall flat 
because they are not supported by the requisite policies that we need to put in place. Now, the theme or the topic of this session is about what are the opportunities in Africa? And I think the very fact that we need a Marshall Plan is a huge opportunity. It's like you have an elephant in front of you and you have to start thinking about where you should start biting to eat the elephant. That's how large the opportunities are. The plight of disease, poor education, poor transportation across the continent, uh, poor telecommunication uh, capabilities, all these are opportunities that make themselves readily available for anyone who wants to invest, whether it's for profit or for social return. And that for me is a very good starting point about thinking about what are the opportunities in Africa. In one of the sessions that we're where we, we had a discussion yesterday, there was a comment about impact investing not guaranteeing market returns. And I actually turned that around. And I said, where there is a need, the likelihood is that impact investment is going to give you above average market returns. If you believe that any shortage of a service by itself has an, up, has an upliftment in the price of the service that you're going to produce, the likelihood is that the returns are going to be higher under those circumstances. Therefore, it is not necessarily true that if you focus on impact investing, the likelihood is that you're going to end up with lower returns than what the market is going to promise. Okay. So those are the thoughts that have been ringing in my mind coming here. And I think the agenda needs to change. And the agenda needs to go to the level of policy making. It can't be just a commercial discussion. Thank you very much. Hamdia. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Hamdia. Um, I work for Ghana Venture Capital Trust Fund. And I wear different hats. <laughs> so, uh, but generally, the Ghana Venture Capital Trust Fund is a fund established, fully owned by the government of Ghana. We get our funding from the Treasury, and we invest in first-time fund managers to invest in the ecosystem. So we were created with the mandate of building the VC impact investing ecosystem uh, in Ghana, and uh, try to get the fund managers build track record, what the other investors are looking for, and then they can scale and invest across uh, the region. So most of our investments are in Ghana, depending upon who is an investor in the fund. Some of the fund managers invest in Ivory Coast, Liberia, and Sierra Leone for now. And it all started because we have this uh, issue of investor mismatch, you would often hear that uh, we don't have deals, the deal sizes are small uh, in Africa. And the question that I keep asking myself is that who is going to make the deals bigger for the big investors to come in? So somehow, somebody got to get it done, and, and, and so. And we also know that in the field of uh, VC, for example, Fund managers, it's difficult for a fund manager, a first-time fund manager getting up saying, I'm raising money. Because even the DFIs don't want to do first-time fund managers. They want to ask for a track record. And, and the track record is what you've done. And so how do you have that track record to show? So basically, that's what we do. So we work with the fund managers, build the team, anchor them and go on the road to raise funding uh, with them. After their first fund, they are on their own. <laughs> and, 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 and it's interesting because there is so much opportunities uh, uh, in, in, in the region. And because of the sheer amount of, invest, sheer amount of funds that we are looking to deploy, 
we are unable to see these opportunities. And I think that we should begin to look at some of these funds. I mean, I know DFI sometimes don't even, or some investors actually don't like country funds because they want to diversify their, their risk and all that. But then you can do regional funds and try to see how you can invest in maybe a multiple few countries. Um, I am not a believer of Pan-African funds because Africa is 54 countries and we are not homogeneous. And so if you do a Pan-African fund, you're going to have issues and we are seeing the issues happening. Uh, because it's just not possible. You need the team on the ground who have the understanding of where to get the deals and, and do the right kinds of investment. The other thing that I think that we need to look at that I have been looking at in the West Africa region is building the pipeline. Um, the ticket sizes, yes, are small. Sometimes the businesses are not really ready uh, when, when, when you want to deploy the capital. So over the last five years, I have been working on incubation as a relation where we are trying to target young people uh, with great ideas, trying to get them to learn by doing through incubation as a relation. And we feel that from graduating from as a relation, they should be ready to receive funding. At least they probably would have had a, a structured, you know, business strategy with a governance that we think that they can be helped to get uh, their businesses true. And uh, maybe I'll end there. But um, in terms of opportunities, I think that we, um, as the trust fund, our portfolio is mostly in education, in agriculture, uh, in housing, and in health. And I think that um, agriculture has a huge potential in Africa um, because Africa is essentially agrarian and we still can't feed ourselves and it, it is really sad. And poverty in Africa actually has to do with the smallholder farmers uh, within the context of Ghana, Nigeria and other countries. It's about 60% of the population are in agriculture. And so, if you really want to reduce poverty, if you want to tackle gender disparity, you need to look at agriculture, on the ground, primary agriculture, and then you will be able to, we will be able to feed ourselves, because it's when you're able to feed yourself that you can think of other things. And we've seen uh, some results showing that in improvement in food production also do, can deal with malnutrition, and then also improve the economic growth of the country. So that's one. Another one is education, and if the estimates that are coming out are anything to go by, then we are really living a time bomb, because you cannot have semi-literate and uneducated one billion population, you know, certain day within the next few years, and, 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 and the time to act is now. And we have had that staring us out in the face uh, in Ghana uh, just about a month ago because last year, the government decided that they were going to introduce what we call the free senior high school policy. In Ghana, we have the free compulsory basic education. And so education at the basic level is free and compulsory. But then from junior high school going to senior high school, parents have to pay. So the government says, you know what, we're going to make free high school, you know, high school free from last year. And everybody's like, but it's going to have a lot of impact on our budget. I mean, this is going to cost us about 1.2 billion, you know, only on that, and it's too much. But this year, we woke up and we realized that actually, from high school to senior high school, only about 60% are able to make it to senior high school from junior high school, and not because of grades, but it's because their parents couldn't afford to pay for them to go to senior high school. So the moment the free senior high school policy was implemented last year, this year we had a jump, and we don't have the infrastructure to be able to manage the turnout. So now we are looking for money to build more infrastructure, 
And the short gap measure is to make it that a first batch go to school and then come back three months later and then the second batch goes. So these are some of the opportunities that we have in Africa and the challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Hamdia. Please, Nicola. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm uh, Nicola Golombic from Yellowwoods in South Africa. Um, Yellowwoods is a, a private investment holding company and a, and a family office, and we sort of run our, our, our business in a way that is focused on inclusive economy and inclusive growth, and um, we actually sort of don't separate those two functions, our social impact and our financial impact. We, we think of it as a blend in, in the way we, we manage our portfolio. Um, and uh, so we, we have um, our, our long-term holders of operating businesses that have been born in Africa, are now multinationals, um, but still have their, their, their strong roots and provenance in Africa. So Nando's, Hollard Insurance, uh, and beyond might be some businesses people are familiar with. Um, and, and so our, our sort of first focus on impact investing in Africa is to really make sure that as a, as in the way, the way our shareholder value framework works um, is that we deploy those businesses and the capital that we deploy within and behind those businesses in a way that generates significant social value uh, and positive social return uh, in addition to uh, financial return. Um, and, and we think that's an important perspective, actually, on impact investing in Africa, is, is to not underestimate the deployment of capital through large corporates and, and, and operating businesses on the continent. Um, then secondly, I mean, we, we have a very strong focus. We take a long view on value. We take a, a, an intergenerational view on, on Africa and the world. And in taking that view, we are very conscious that Africa's going to have the biggest working age population by the 30s. We're going to have a billion young Africans. We call it the boom or bust generation. And so we have been very focused on, on thinking about what, what it, that's like a 15-year project, right? That's, that's not long. We don't have long. Those babies are being born every day, right? So that population bulge is happening. And um, when you think about it in real time, um, it, it's, it's quite imperative that we understand that we need to accelerate the transition of young Africans into economic participation. But we very much see that as an opportunity. Uh, we, are, we have built businesses in Africa, we continue to see opportunity and build businesses in Africa, and every day confirms that young people are an asset on the African continent. There is a massive wealth of human capital to be unlocked, um, and so we're very focused on that dividend over the next 15, 20 years. And um, we established a, an, a labor market intermediary called the Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator in order to sort of work at an ecosystem level to, to tackle some of the systemic failures, both in the market failures and the, the, the system failures, that are holding back young Africans from realizing um, their economic participation and their human capital. Um, it's been a very successful operator in South Africa. Um, it's got about a half a million young people growing their employability in its network and has placed about 55,000 young people into full-time employment from long-term unemployment. And in doing that, um, has managed to gather some of the biggest data, sort of some big data on this cohort of young Africans. Um, and we've now recently launched a SIP um, where we're going to focus on basically financing uh, accelerated skilling of young Africans that do not require tertiary, uh, but require skilling for growth sectors in tech, in, in business services, growing the outsourcing markets in Africa, uh, in installation, repair, and maintenance to sort of follow through on the innovations that are happening in ag value chains, in manufacturing, and in infrastructure, um, and the, the growth of the middle class, um, and, you know, and, and then other growth sectors like the education and care economy. So really what we're, what we're doing is, is we created a SIB that can, can use and redirect existing public and DFI and development finance to achieve those outcomes in a much faster and more efficient way. 
uh, and deploy investment capital uh, in a way that, that drives that systemic efficiency, but also creates a return for investors who are interested in addressing the real-time demand supply mismatches in skills in Africa. And I do think that that is key because whether we're talking about job creators, starting businesses, large businesses growing on the continent, um, or you know, any kind of growth entrepreneur ecosystems, we need skills at all levels. And we cannot only be banking on improvements in the education systems. That is a very long game. What we need is breakthrough solutions for real-time skilling that is demand-focused, and um, that's what we've been focusing on. Thank you very much, Vikas. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Vikas Bali, and I represent the Avishkar IntelliCap Group. Uh, the group's vision is to build businesses for the other three billion. And in that quest, we have two parts to our business. One is a balance sheet part, which invests in early stage enterprises. Uh, it's called Avishkar. We have invested in about 65 uh, odd early stage enterprises uh, in India and in, uh, in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. And we have partially exited about 23 or 24 uh, investments, either fully or partially. We also have a few debt vehicles, um, you know, which uh, give cash flow based lending to early stage enterprises. We have some fintech platforms. So that's on the balance sheet side of the business. And we have deployed about $750, $800 million in both debt and equity towards these enterprises. On the ecosystem building part in Telecap, our mission is to build enabling ecosystems, channelize capital to build a more sustainable, equitable society. Our theory of change is centered completely around social enterprises. And we believe that what the governments were not able to do, what the NGOs were not able to do, it's the social enterprises which will be able to deliver impact at scale and make our society much more equitable. Through this journey, uh, we have um, worked uh, through a confluence of capital, knowledge, and networks in order to make the entrepreneurs more successful. So we have an advisory group, a banking group, which helps enterprises raise capital either in the form of debt, equity, or a structured um, product. And we have a forum called Sankalp, which is essentially a celebration of entrepreneurship. It gets together the entire development sector, the impact investors, other large investors, regulators, and more importantly, the entrepreneurs in a room in order to discuss the challenges uh, that the entrepreneurs face and what are some of the steps that all of these other relevant stakeholders can take in order to address the needs of the entrepreneur and make them more successful. We have done Sankalps in India, in Jakarta, and in Nairobi, where we will have our sixth event uh, coming up on February 21st and 22nd. Our love affair with Africa started about five to six years ago, <clears throat> where we thought that we could establish a south-south corridor between the learnings that the Avishkar IntelliCap group have generated over the past 17, 18 years in India and Southeast Asia and to try and learn some uh, things from the African market as well. So develop a corridor between India and Africa. And we chose to set up our office in uh, East Africa, in Nairobi, about five years ago. Our immediate task of setting up an office in Nairobi was to develop the early stage entrepreneurial ecosystem. We believe that it's a long journey, and it starts by channelizing the local pools of capital and growing an angel network in that particular market. So we have established an angel network called I3N, which has now about 45, 50 investors. Through our journey and through the Sankalps, the five Sankalps that we have done in Nairobi, we have sourced about 700 odd enterprises in the fields of clean energy, agri, water sanitation, financial inclusion, health, and um, 
supported some of these enterprises, about 30 of them, in a more intensive manner, and uh, um, a handful in actually channelizing capital towards these as well. The enterprises that we have worked with have generated uh, employment for about 1,000 odd people and have now got revenues in the range of about 10 odd million dollars. And three or four years ago, all these numbers were next to nothing. So as a group, we work very closely with very early stage enterprises and really help them scale up bit by bit. Most of the investments that Avishkar makes are in enterprises who have very low revenues. Business models are just getting defined and we are typically the early stage investors. And IntelliCap really creates the ecosystem for those entrepreneurs to become successful by connecting them with markets, by connecting them with capital, and by providing them the necessary knowledge on the business models that will make them successful. We hope to expand our journey into Africa. Uh, we have already been in, uh, in Nairobi and have serviced the East African uh, uh, countries through our office in Nairobi. Avishkar is now going to launch a fund uh, which was going to be centered around East Africa but would also look at opportunities for investments in Nigeria and Ghana. It's going to be a $150 million fund uh, and is going to be launched in the next six to eight months. So our commitment to Africa is steadfast and we believe that with the learnings and experience that we have had both in India and in East Africa, we will now be able to set up a fund that will act as an opportunity for entrepreneurs to get the risk capital that they're looking for. With this, I'd like to hand the mic back. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, let's now open the discussion to members of the floor. Uh, please um, identify yourself by your name and your organization. And if there is a question that you would like to direct to any one of the specific panelists, please do so. Otherwise, I'll decide um, who best to put the question to. So please, let's start. And then we have about 10 minutes in the end where we will wrap up by some calls for action, which each of us has identified as being very important takeaways from this session. So questions, please. I'm Sophie Maisonneuve. I'm working in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, panel. Um, so as a donor, as a... Uh, as an agency, as a donor agency, uh, uh, so I'm not an agency, I'm the ministry, but of course we have AFD, Agence Française de Développement, who is very active in, in Africa. So what could be, do you have a piece of advice? Uh, in where sh sh shall we invest? How, what is our added value? Um, how can we help without, uh, um, well, we, respecting, uh, you know, uh, national, local, uh, individual uh, and, uh, identities. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> from our perspective, um, while skills to jobs is extremely important, skills to enterprise is something that the world needs to look at, particularly the development world, in a much more granular fashion. If entrepreneurs have to succeed, they cannot do it on themselves. So they need to be nurtured. The kind of problems that we are trying to address, humanity has been trying to address for many, many hundreds of years. These are not easy problems to address. Entrepreneurs in social field have to be created. As I was giving you the example of our experience as Avishkar in Telecap in, uh, in the context of India and Southeast Asia, we find that we have to marry a great business idea with a great entrepreneur and then stay with the entrepreneur through his journey, his or her journey. It's not about handing them a, a check and that's the end of the story and we'll get our returns in five, seven, ten years. It just does not work like that. We have to work along with the entrepreneur step by step, helping them pivot their business models, help them attract the right kind of talent help them in cases of emergencies and exigencies which will happen for such entrepreneurs and stay the course. And therefore we believe that any donor agency should necessarily have a view on a longer term horizon. So most impact funds would be 
looking at seven years, eight years, I think we need to look at into decades, 10, 12, 15 years, because these are very, very long-term investment ideas and opportunities. And therefore, any agency needs to look at it from a very, very patient standpoint. Look at returns, certainly demand returns. Yeah? I think the world has to move away from, well, here's a check and that's the end of the story, to this is returnable capital. At some point in time, you need to give the money back. Right? Most of the world needs to move in that so direction. So a couple of um, minor thoughts there. Um, there isn't really a thriving or viable market for exits um, for impact investments. Um, nor, nor is there, nor are there exchanges where you could list some of these social enterprises and allow investors to get some exit. So how how do you propose to address that situation? Uh, from our perspective, uh, again, our learnings from India and Southeast Asia, when we entered the, the space, uh, opportunities for exits were not there. Uh, we started the journey in 2001, where we started making investments in early stage enterprises. And today, some of those com entities are listed on the Indian stock markets. So it's a process, it's a journey, but it has to be built brick by brick, which starts with the local pools of capital, the fly-in, fly-out, uh, overseas investors searching for the expat entrepreneurs. That's not a model which is going to work. It's got to be homegrown entrepreneurs with local pools of capital, with risk investors uh, like ourselves and m many of the other 230, 40 impact investors that exist who need to get into that market, need to take that first um, uh, leap of faith, and make sure that uh, at the same time the entire entrepreneur uh, ecosystem is being created. Eventually the investor needs their return and typically it will come through uh, either a strategic exit or the larger private equity investors coming in and buying off the stakes of the impact investors. That entire sequence of events and journey needs to be certainly created. It will not happen in a day, but it needs to start with local capital and local entrepreneurs as the first step. Thank you. Next question. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So I had to, I, my name is Abhishek Agrawal. I come from Axion International, which is an impact investment fund, investing in early stage to growth stage companies. And we have been operating globally. And I had two questions, one for Hamdia and other one for Nicola and Vikas. Uh, so the first question is, as you said, that there is this challenge um, in the market, African market for the growth companies Generally, everybody is, is saying, where is the growth companies? And, and there is this whole cyclical problem. How are you really seeing it? Because we also see, while we have a number of companies in Africa, but we want to do more and more. But the challenge is there are not many companies, either in early stage or, or the growth capital, both. And we find significant challenges over there. So, so how are you really working towards from your early stage and building them up? what has been your experience. Second is to Nicola and Vikas, uh, how are you seeing that, what, what support some of these companies really need in your market? Um, um, and is it, I think Vikas, you were just touching upon on that, it's not just about writing the check, but in your experience, what type of technical support or advisory support and other help you have been giving to these early stage entrepreneurs which is helping them in thriving their business models? Thank you. Experience on early stage investing, was that your question? Okay, so um, you see, VC investment you know, in Africa, we need to look at it as a value chain. So when you do the first investment, you are looking for maybe another fund to take those investments off your hands, or you are looking to get a trade sale, or you are looking to get the owners to buy you back. Because most of the challenges we've had is that people don't really want equity investment because they don't want you to tell them what to do. And it, it was a long battle when we started. I mean, you walk through the realm with, with, with investee companies, and then at the last minute, when they're going to sign the investment agreement, they realize that you are taking two board seats, and they are like, no. The board is made up of me, my wife, and children, and that's how it's going to be. So let's convert it into a loan so that I could pay 
because that's what we are used to. So we, 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 we are building the ecosystem to get people to understand that VC investors, impact investors come in and give you value in addition to money. Right? So we help you do other things. So that is the selling point. And yes, it's been, it's been very difficult, and, um, but I think it's worthwhile because dealing with early, st dealing with early stage companies is a difficulty. Uh, sometimes you need to really buy into the strategy, but you also need to know where you're taking the company to. You need to understand the value you want to unlock in that business before you even get in. And, and sometimes I think um, fund managers get carried away with the passion that, oh, this is good, this fits my portfolio, this makes it nice. But when the chemistry doesn't work between you and the entrepreneur, it's not going to work. So there's so much dynamics in, in investing in the, in the early stage market. But I wanted to talk about exit. You know, I think that sometimes we overplay the issue of exit, right? Because we don't have developed capital markets. That is true in Africa. Maybe the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, fine. Ghana Stock Exchange still has about 36 companies listed since 1991. The Nigerian Stock Exchange is not doing any better. So really, this IPO business, where is it coming from? We have done six exit from our portfolio and they were all through trade sales and we made four times multiple. So anytime I hear the issue of exit because we are not doing IPOs, um, I don't get it because there are other ways to exit. And we have done well in our exit and they were trade, trade sales. So I think we should begin to look at other ways of exits instead of just always putting more traction on the IPO until we're able to build a formidable capital market because we don't have it. And the second, the second uh, thing that we have done in Ghana is that we've worked with the Ghana Stock Exchange to actually create a second tier market which we call the Ghana Alternative Exchange. And what we do with the Ghana Alternative Exchange is to reduce the re listing requirement for SMEs so that they can list and so they can raise some money and the GAX was launched last year, and we have listed eight companies on the GAX. Two is coming from our portfolio. But for me, if I have a meeting with a fund manager and all his attention is IPO, I actually get very worried because it's not going to work. So tell me the reality on the ground that, look, I rather have a dividend model where I'm going to exit at a certain point in time instead of telling me that my exit strategy is an IPO because you, 99% of the time, are not going to get it. And it makes me feel that as a fund manager, you really are not in touch with the reality on the ground. Thank you. Sure, so I'll give a different kind of perspective. You know, in, in going back to aphorisms, we, we talk in yellow words about chasing elephants, not mice, right? In sort of, and loving the problem, not the solution. And um, just, you know, uh, when we talk about ecosystems, I, I think that there's the ecosystem around entrepreneurs. And then there's a sort of bigger sense of tipping points in, a, in an environment, right? And the, I'm a big believer in the fact that quite a few things have to happen simultaneously for these ecosystems to really work, right? You need a kind of confluence of things. And so one of the appeals that I would make to a forum like this where you can see there are very different kinds of capital I mean, the one thing that a lot of people in the room seem to share is that they're deployers of capital, but the, the, the risk and return expectations are very varied. Um, I think that the magic in, in, in our experience in an African context is when those things happen with a simultaneity, a kind of just, that, that really create the ecosystem that you need. Because actually what entrepreneurs need is customers, right? They don't just need capital. Right? They need customers, the cap customers have to be viable, customers, um, you know, they have to be consistent and sustainable customers. Um, now, I mean, that sounds obvious, but I mean, it's actually really important, right? These are real businesses and these are real economies. Um, and, you know, they, they also need governments to behave in a particular way. And then when they need to find talent, they don't just need advice about talent. They actually have to know that there's a pool of work-ready talent available at a price, right, that is 
that, that is meaningful to an entrepreneur in that context. So I'm just trying to paint a little picture around, you know, the different ways to think about ecosystems, but we increasingly take a view that the African, there, there are a few cities in Africa that are really going to matter. Um, the ag value chain does matter and food security does matter, but actually the biggest markets for that food first and foremost are going to be the cities in Africa to which there is massive inward migration. And um, so I think it's quite interesting to just think about like ecosystems as being very geographically located. Um, you know, there's a tendency with tech and everything to think in a very dispersed way, but in fact, um, the tech lands in the end, you know, the Uber drivers are driving real cars and for the moment anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, the food actually gets consumed, right? No matter what tech is driving the, the, the weather indexes, right? So I, I think that thinking in real physical locations um, and organizing investment and different kind, blending the kinds of investment, collaborations and cooperation, between kinds of capital in particular market ecosystems is a very important way for a, a summit like this to start organizing people when we think about a call to action. Can I just um, ask uh, Ella a couple of questions? Uh, in your um, Marshall Plan for Africa, um, how do you see or what do you see to be the role of technology in light of the future of work? And secondly, how do you address the very big question the word that begins with a big capital C, corruption, and how is that going to be addressed if you want to realize your dream of impact investing, fulfilling the Marshall Plan? I, I think technology is one of the biggest interventions in the African continent. What we have seen is that the reason we are unable to compete as a continental economy is because of inefficiencies inefficiencies across the board, at production, at distribution, and at entering and staying in markets. And to a large extent, it's because of the quality of production processes that we pursue. And that means technology has to be key. And before we came here, we spoke about um, the inefficiency in the food distribution um, on the continent. The UN, about five years ago, put out a study that shows that 20% of the food is lost between the factory gate and the plate. And it's not lost because we, don't, we just don't want it. It's lost because we don't manage the transition from between the two points properly. So the issue of distribution is very key, the issue of transportation. It took Obama to come to Africa and remind us that we need energy to generate a new economy. And that means there's a lot of investment that is required in building those capabilities. But more importantly, in all these constraints that I'm talking about, policy remains key. Africa has the best climate. Africa has most of the water on the world. And there's a lot of opportunities that uh, natural endowments that South Africa has, but we do not capitalize on those endowments. And this is because of bad policies, bad governance, and bad leadership. And those put together conflate into the, the big C that you spoke about, corruption. And one is tempted to even think that actually corruption is sponsored to deliberately achieve self-centered interests. It's not a mistake. It is engineered for it to deliver a particular output. I'll give you an example in the southern part of Africa. We have the potential of producing electricity for the whole continent by investing in one plant. And this is a de de debate or discussion that has taken over 30 years in the southern region to put up this, this electricity plant. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened not because it is not possible, not because there are no financial resources to do it. 
it's not happening because there's no political will. And I think it's convenient for the politicians for it not to happen. And it's not clear why. But you cannot reconcile the political interest with the commercial interest. Because every investor that you talk about says we want more energy, we might want more electricity on the continent, but it's just not happening. How you deal with corruption, I think we can leave to the audience to guide us. So we have one more question from the floor, and then we will wrap up by each of us articulating what our call for action are, okay? So please. Govind Venu Prasad, International Trade Center. Uh, very interesting discussion. I don't know, Mr. Amersi, if uh, members of the audience are allowed to suggest possible calls of action. <laughs> In any case, uh, I think it's been very interesting. You know, we've picked on everything from A to Z and, uh, you know, homegrown and, uh, you know, entrepreneurship. There was an article recently in the Financial Times that said just, and I'll focus on East Africa because that's where most of my work is. Kampala is going to grow by about 140%. And any of us who've been by 2030, and any of us who've been to that city knows how, as things stand, it's stretched. Very beautiful, but totally stretched. Nicola spoke about the migration into cities. I think cities are an important ecosystem. But it's, it's really counterintuitive in an agrarian economy because this migration is from the rural areas, which should be you know, growing food. And then we talk of farmers, we talk of agri. So my request would be, can the call to action be that we make agri sexy once again? because that may just about save the continent. Thank you. Nicola, do you want to take that? Two minutes, please. Um, I mean, I definitely think that uh, there is a need for, you know, to, to create economic opportunity for young people. If you want to make it sexy, it has to appeal to young people. Um, so, uh, you know, th there is no doubt that the ag value chain, and particularly a tech-enabled ag value chain, and even you know, innovations in last mile logistics, innovations in, in you know, uh, import and export, you know, value chains. There are a lot of opportunities to make agriculture sexy, but one of the ways is to not make it look like agriculture. Um, so I think if we can just separate agriculture from farming, that would be a really good start. Um, and um, I, I think in the minds of young people. Um, but I do think that we mustn't make these like, um, separate issues, right? So jobs and entrepreneurship are not separate issues. The IMF study in South Africa, and in fact, Southern Africa recently was very clear. The, the highest correlate to likelihood of success as an entrepreneur is you've worked before, right? So, you know, these are not separate issues. And similarly, you know, young people, certainly in my country, there's no such thing as a rural youth and there's no such thing as a city youth. People are moving between the one and the other. And understanding the relationship between rural and urban economies, I think, is actually where a lot of the opportunity lies. Um, I think we now have time for a, a call to action. At many of these conferences, we have a great discussion. People go away thinking that they've really done so much good, but nothing ever comes out of it. So this conference is a little different. Uh, as the moderators, we've been asked to identify two or three calls for action so that people go away from here thinking about what they need to do. So let me start off by um, articulating one or two calls for action that I think are important. Firstly, I take my hat off to India that introduced this 2% CSR levy. I did my level best during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London this year to try and get the Commonwealth member states to also follow suit and implement uh, India's leadership in this area. Um, and I think that uh, we got traction amongst some member states. Some of them pointed to inaction on India's part in terms of how they deploy this 2%, who decides where is it spent, is it tax deductible or not. 
So I think that I would ask all of you that are in a position to influence your governments in any form or shape to go back and to push hard for this 2% tax to be imposed, CSR tax, and that then will create a pool of capital that can be deployed for social impact investing. So that's my number one call for action. My number two call for action is something that came up with the discussions that uh, Ella in his uh, speech said. So when you are looking, and we all of us believe that whenever we are looking at impact investing, most donors, most investors are talking about financial returns. Unfortunately, the methodology that is measuring returns is very skewed only towards measuring financial returns until the world wakes up and says that any balance sheet of any enterprise has got so many different forms of capital working for it, human capital, societal capital, natural capital, environmental capital, as well as financial capital, and you then have a valuation matrix that takes into account on a weighted average basis all these different forms of capital and how they contribute to the enterprise, then and only then you will have a level playing field and the world will be a far better place because executives will be rewarded not only by share price performance or bonuses, but actually by how responsible they have been in the way they have run their enterprises. So I would ask everyone in this room to go back and to talk about accounting standards, to talk to corporations, to senior executives, and people that are in a policy-making framework to say that, look, based on just last week, if you look at the Tory party conference in London, the Labour party conference in London, Larry Fink's remarks, they are all talking about capitalism that has to be inclusive and not exclusive. So those are my two main calls for action. Ella. Mine, mine is a very simple one. We know the problems, we have the solutions on paper, we know what to do. And I think there are two things that uh, our political and uh, business leaders should be focusing on. Enablement and action of the things that need to be done. And out of this uh, two, three day gathering, I think we need to make it our responsibility to get all those leaders to understand that impact investing should be at the center of everything they do. I believe that um, we need to unlock value in the enterprises, whether it's a social enterprise or uh, it's for you know, any other enterprise. But we need to unlock value and we need to hold each other accountable for each of the values that we want to unlock in these enterprises. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to um, really encourage a, a, um, a convergence of impact so that we get real multipliers. And um, to facilitate that, I mean, a, f a number of us are starting something called a Future Work Africa initiative where really we're trying to bring together a community of investors across the sort of spectrum um, in particular geographies or value chains to understand how, how we can make a few dots join and, and things and multipliers happen and accelerate. So if anybody's interested in the idea of being part of a Future Work Africa collective or initiative, um, I, th that's my call to action. That's how we'll create economic opportunities for young people. Um. I'm the last speaker, so let me just summarize what has been said. I'd like to have a call to action for investors, for governmental stakeholders and entrepreneurs. From an investor standpoint, follow the approach of sow, ten, reap. Just as the plant seeds needs to be put in, nurtured, given the right kind of environment, so too with the entrepreneur. So all of you investors in the room, adopt this approach. Make sure that you are patient, your capital is patient, be demanding but give it time. From a governmental standpoint, small is good. And that's where the opportunity lies for scale. So small and medium enterprises need to be nurtured and all enabling regulation environment needs to be provided for them to nurture. 
that's where the numbers are going to come from. And from the entrepreneur's perspective, the call to action has to be very clearly move away from me to business models to finding, finding some innovations. Time's up. Thank you very much. Uh, a big thank you to my distinguished panel here who have given up their time and have shared their valuable insights here. And thank you to the audience for being so responsive and uh, engaging. Thank you.